Hi, I'm Larry McCullough, and welcome to the Hall Institute of Public Policy series on the American Voter 2012. One of the most critical elements of any political campaign is finding effective ways to get out the vote, uh, making sure that voters favorable to your candidate or your issue get to the polls to register their opinion. Now, this isn't just a modern strategy. Um, listen to these get out the vote tips that were outlined by a state legislator from Illinois in the year 1840. Divide the country into small districts and appoint in each a subcommittee. Make a perfect list of all the voters and ascertain with certainty for whom they will vote. Keep a constant watch on the doubtful voters and have them talked to by those in whom they have the most confidence. And on election day, see that every Whig is brought to the polls. And that 1840 legislator was Abraham Lincoln, uh, writing in a local newspaper. Now, to talk about today's uh, get out the vote methods, we have Trisha Mueller who is the political director at the Northeast Regional Council of Carpenters. Ms. Mueller was the New Jersey State Director uh, for Obama at America in 2008, and she was uh, the coordinator of John Corzine's successful gubernatorial campaign in 2005. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, in terms of how candidates approach a, ca a campaign today, What's the basic structure of a get out the vote campaign? What are the essentials that, that you really have to have? You know, get out the vote is usually, if you look at the sort of the timeline of a campaign, the get out the vote structure is usually at the end. Mm -hmm. um, Nothing to say that everything doesn't lead up until mm -hmm. that, that culminating end. So, you know, a lot of campaigns will focus on media, as we know. A lot of it is airtime, print, commercials, um, and then everything has it culminates into a strategic get out the vote plan. So meaning that everything the candidate does from the beginning until the end, it's all about getting that voter to the poll for he or she. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, get out the vote can be at the beginning of a campaign. It could be everything from just voter ID programs. So you'll run, run phones and run uh, mail programs and people knocking at your doors to identify voters. And it's interesting to listen to that quote because that's, that's not so different from what it is that we do now. And it's building your list and managing a list. And that's exactly in modern time, that's what we do. So we have voter lists of everyone from, you know, Republican, Democrat, independent voters, which is the block of what we have here in New Jersey, their voting history and how we sort of manage that list and how according to that list that's how we craft our message of how we're talking to people and what that message is so mm -hmm. that's sort of the first element sort of the sort of like the baseline if you will mm -hmm. um, as it sort of escalates into full-blown get out the vote which is you know when you run a, a GOTV plan it probably begins probably in the last four weeks of a campaign mm -hmm. in earnest yeah. And what elements do those have then? What, so you're in the last four weeks. So everything that, that, lead, that leads up to what we call pre-GOTV and GOTV. Everything in pre-GOTV is all of that voter identification. So you might be an unidentified, you know, voter. You, you know, you are a registered Democrat. You've only voted in one of the last four elections, which means that you're not really that keyed in. You're only a presidential election voter. Um, and so you might get a couple different passes. You might get, you know, a pass on a phone, a knock at the door. Um, and all that information goes back into a list which helps us identify what the list is going to be for election day or the weekend leading up to it. So um, everything is based on the quality of information that we have in the voter file. Um, and that is integral, mm -hmm. the quality of the voter file and how you manipulate the voter file. And that's sort of, you know, some of, because campaigns, I think, especially today, are so specific to the, the voter, you see lots of targeting happening now. A very specific messages crafted for blocks of voters based on their voting demographic. Mm -hmm. So that could be an independent woman who lives for, in Hamilton, you know, because that, that message is very different from saying, you know, African-American voter in Central Ward, Newark. Mm -hmm much different message. Um, and to say that the, that the end result isn't going to be the same. Okay. And so based on what the voting demographic is, throughout the course of the campaign, so it could be a series of events catered to a certain block of voters. It could be um, at the door messaging, on the phone messaging. Um, and now with new technology, now you have, you know, emails and websites and Facebook and social yeah. networking. That's a whole other campaign that's been sort of overlaid over top of a traditional uh, campaign strategy. Yeah. Now, how do, you talk about the voter file. How does that information get gathered? Where does all that come from? The information gets gathered from, you, know, you have your state board of elections, um, and you have, you have companies. You have companies who actually compile the information, um, and it's, it's, 
it can be quite lucrative, I'm, I'm sure. But <laughs> but um, you have you have companies who manage this information based on uh, voting history, and you don't know you don't know who they voted for, but mm -hmm. you know how they voted. Meaning, did they vote in the primary? Did they vote in their school board election? Did they vote in their general election? So if you have a you know what we call a four out of four voter, someone who's voting over the last four cycles, regardless of what it was, they vote in primaries, they vote in generals, they vote for their school board, they vote for planning, they they vote. Which means that the reality of it is, in terms of the effort that you're going to put forward to get that person to the poll, is probably going to be less mm -hmm. than someone who's saying you have maybe a two out of four voter who votes sometimes, has some level of interest, yeah. um, but not necessarily is that dyed in the wool, you know, voting is my right and I'm going to exercise it every chance that I get. Um, and so, you know, that's even how campaign budgets are even are even crafted, you know, in terms of where they're going to put the majority of their resources, and if the majority of the resources is going to go into the still the the the, the undecided voter, um, and you see that now. I mean, even the presidential elections you see in Ohio, you see in Pennsylvania, these battleground states aren't called battleground for you know reason. You know, you have large blocks of you know voters who still haven't made up their mind. Yeah, yeah last week we talked with uh, uh, Ingrid Reed about why people don't vote. Mm -hmm. and, and the percentage is that. Um, so given that there are, it seems in an election, usually about one third or one quarter of people that don't vote, even in a national election, are, are you using this information that you're gathering in the voter file to really try and incite them to vote? Or are you specifically going after them? I think you're going after people who are inclined to vote for your candidate. Okay. So that, and that doesn't mean to skirt the question. So, yeah. for instance, so if you know if you have a, a large chunk of people who aren't regular voters, but you know based on lack of voting record, based on um, socioeconomic information, people who they, you, you know registration, mm -hmm. you know, Republicans and Republican districts, if you want Democratic candidate to win, you're not necessarily going <laughs> to yeah. bring those folks to the polls. Yeah. You know, conversely, on the Republican side, they might say, "Hey, we need to get these people to the polls because we know once they get there, they're going to vote our way." So yeah. it really is very strategic. The art of getting out the vote, um, especially in elections where the where the where the margins of success are going to be so narrow. When you're looking at a race that's going to be within two points, three points, that pull to the polls is very, very specific. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people who have been very successful and have the ability to do that really, really well. Now, what about issue campaigns, like say referendums? Mm -hmm. That's a little bit different because it is. that kind of all often crosses party lines. Um, I think on the referendum stuff, and I think once again, you know, a lot of it's going to also be based on polling information too. I mean, it's something we haven't really talked about in this context. We talk about the voter file, how you know, identify voters and media, but it also comes down to quality polling. And you know, and I think sometimes that that cuts both ways. I think some people are get really tired of being overpolled, <laughs> you know, because then just sort of it's a lack of um, sincerity on a candidate's uh, part, um, which I understand. When it comes to an issues-based campaign like a referendum. Um, I think that becomes a little bit different because that's the only way that you're going to be able to sort of put your finger on the pulse of what the voter um, is thinking. Now you put a referendum on the same on the same ballot as a large candidate election, a presidential or a gubernatorial. That's something you have to measure into it as well because your turnout's going to be higher. You know, is that turnout going to be more inclined to vote for your referendum or less inclined? And so it's sort of there's a, there's a strategy to that as well. Um, but it's still all about it goes back to the voter file in terms of how people vote. You know, voters are voters. You know, at the, at the end of the day, you have certain people who really put a lot of uh, weight on civic action. Mm -hmm. You know, it's my it's my duty as an American, as a citizen, to vote. Some people, they don't care. Some people are just it's so far, you know, beyond them. So, sort of trying to get into the middle of all of that and the, and to decide, that's where the real art of GOTV is. Yeah. Now, when reaching out, of course, you know, uh, the the final days before a campaign, you get the robocalls. Yeah. And and uh, sometimes they you know they're, they're dueling robocalls from the candidate even in local elections. Right. They're being used really a lot. Yeah. Um, how does that aspect work? You know, I think robocalls are. It works in the same sense that mail is. It's just cheaper, right? Yeah. So if you're so if you're trying to saturate a message in a condensed area, robocalls are the best way to do it. In the sense of, it's really inexpensive. You hit a lot of a lot of households. Is it the most effective? It's a, I think that's that's a sort of 
different people gave me different answers. I'm sort of on the fence about it. Yeah, some I people think, get annoyed. Yeah, they get, like, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, a lot of people, and I think that's that's a challenge that people who are getting at the vote face is people aren't answering their phones anymore. So yeah. a lot of people use their cell phones. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, if they have a landline at their house, they're not really using it or picking it up because they're getting solicited yeah. <laughs> um, in one way or another. Um, so that has changed. You know, there's nothing. Nothing can replace personal voter contact. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, a voter wants to feel valued enough that someone can come to their door, the candidate or representative of, to say, your vote matters. Yeah. And I think that um, no, matter all, no matter what happens, whether it's social networking or Facebook or any of those things, Twitter, at the end of the day, people like to know that their vote matters and it counts. And I think that's why when you, when you go to these battleground states, you're going to see a, lo a, a larger push for those sorts of activities as opposed to what they would consider a blue state in New Jersey. So you're not going to see Obama's campaign in New Jersey this year putting a lot of investment. You probably won't even see the president here, you know, you know but you'll see him in Ohio yeah. <laughs> on the daily or once a week, yeah. you know. So um, once again, it goes back to sort of, you know, the type of voter and the voter that exists in those places. Yeah. Now about social media, uh, like I say, um, you know, 2008 campaign, yeah. I think, was the first where yeah. you could really establish a real personal yeah. connection, oddly yeah. enough, through this impersonal technology. But, I mean, my wife would say, oh, you know, we're, you know, the candidate is, uh, I just got a text. And it's kind of exciting, you know, maybe now it's old hat, but still, yeah. how effective is that? And are people really, what are the new things they're doing yeah. with that? How, you know, how, how specific are they getting there? It was interesting, you know, I was on the ground um, in Governor Corthon's campaign in, in 2005 and then back again in 2009. In 2008, it was very exciting to be a part of the 2008 presidential campaign for a whole host of reasons, but it changed the way campaigns were run. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to be in the middle of it because, if, you know, social networking was real, yeah. Twitter was real, texts were real, and it became this real sort of, it was, it was a pivotal moment in the way that, that campaigns were run and um, and has changed since. So either people are sort of going to catch on with it because that's how people communicate. At the end of the day, you know, if I, I'll see for myself personally how many relationships I have and I maintain through Facebook. Yeah. You know, but you said it's a very impersonal thing, but it's become very personal. It's become very personal. And so I think that campaigns have really latched on to that. You know, what you lose in the social media world is the ability to uh, truly pinpoint who that voter is. There's a level of sort of blanket communication mm -hmm. and lack of, but you know, and, and this is also something, you know, the amount of information that's collected about any person mm -hmm. in technology, whether it's through Facebook or Twitter, people are able to collect lots mm -hmm. of information about where you shop, mm -hmm. what your likes are, and so it's a whole other way to craft voter targeting. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been controversial. I mean, I think that the, 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 first, the first folks who really did targeting this way at this level um, was President Bush. They were, the Republican Party did a phenomenal job at the national level um, in doing this. And so now everyone's sort of playing catch up and sort of has taken it to the next level. Um, but um, it has certainly, it has changed the way voter contact happens, but it hasn't taken away from, in my opinion, what the root of it is and, you know, personal contact. Well, now when they have the technology that, 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 that literally allows someone unseen to see where you are, yeah. where you're going, and then to tell you who else is around you. You know, yeah. your other friends, they say, hey, there's, yeah. a, there's a rally going on, yeah. you know, two blocks from here, let's go. Yeah. That sort of thing would have been impossible in the past. Absolutely. I think, um, if it wasn't the last election, Michelle Bachman, um, during the Minnesota State Fair, sent out a message to people who were on her, her list, uh, on their cell phones, suddenly they got a text message that linked to a little video that was essentially a campaign commercial. It was about corn dogs and cotton candy and state fair type of things. And it was happening while people were actually at the state fair. Yeah, they felt and, connected to it. Yeah, and it's like, oh, wow, my candidate really they're cares present, about me. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting, that even if it's not <laughs> a real. It's scary the, the, that they're the, stalking you, actually, but I mean, that's it's, the illusion. It's, yeah. Or, you know, on the converse, 2008, the Obama application, what they would do is they would take your phone book mm -hmm. and put it in the application. So, for instance, and then I would, I, I would bring up the application. And then all of my friends in Colorado, I would call them because they'd be in my phone book and it was my goal to call my friends in Colorado, mm -hmm. hey, will you please vote for mm -hmm. Senator Obama for president? But that was, that, what a very interesting tool that was. It was an interesting way to sort of, was, what was key about this, it made activists feel vested. Mm -hmm. how many times have you gone to a campaign headquarters and you go and make the same phone calls and mm -hmm. don't really feel attached to it? Social networking in the 08 campaign really made an activist feel that they were literally physically making a difference by calling 
25 people on their phone list mm -hmm. or whatever. And that was a big change. And you saw that sort of, that wave that happened. Mm -hmm. And this sort of this, it beca almost became cool, right? Yeah, to be yeah, a part of the yeah, Obama yeah. campaign, it became cool, yeah. you know? And because it's what was happening. And I think that that has changed a lot moving into 2012, but at the time that was so, so exciting yeah. to be a part of. Now, we hear a lot about PACs and super PACs, yeah. about this huge influx of corporate money. I forget what the statistic was I heard the other day, uh, where the, the, the amount that one super PAC is spending yeah. uh, is actually overwhelmed any previous records of actual yeah. political campaign nas nationally spending. But then again, there's grassroots organizing. Yeah. Um, talk a little about why grassroots uh, organizing is still really important. They're not mutually exclusive. Okay. And, I, and, I, and I'll go back to why I think that's the that's the why I say that, and I say that from the union world, but you know, I think that the idea of, someone said you saw that you know, uh, President Obama's campaign fundraising was, was down compared mm -hmm. to, at this point, the campaign in 2008, and I think that it's because of the role of super PACs that, mm -hmm. that's happening, and so I think on one level that super PACs, when people, when people think of super PACs, they think of airtime and messaging, and that's how they're sort of you know, um, skirting campaign finance law, and, and I was even talking to a colleague of mine just saying this kind of, what have we done in this campaign world to sort of allow this to happen yeah. because the amount, of, the amount of money. You know, super PACs can also come into play into the grassroots world when you have uh, large unions mm -hmm. who will use super PACs or independent expenditures to mobilize voters mm -hmm. on issues. So it does cut, I think people hear, when they hear yeah. super PAC, they hear independent expenditure, they yeah. think of sort of big bad corporate. Yeah. But it also, you know, there's the other side of that. And yeah. so it could be used both ways. Okay. So when you have, there, there, there are some large unions in this mm -hmm. country who, when you look at sort of what their PAC contributions are, or what their PACs are, and you go over and maybe you look at one of their independent expenditure campaigns, and that's where the real money is. And mm -hmm. so, and a lot of those, a lot of those union members are being used in grassroots activities. Mm -hmm. So whether that, I mean, those folks are being used for your canvases, mm -hmm. your phone banks, your voter registration efforts, um, there is a little bit of both yeah. in that. When you talk about traditional grassroots organizing, I can speak for the Democratic Party. I really think that we need to be doing more of it mm -hmm. um, because in New Jersey specifically, we have a campaign every single year. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we never have an off year, mm -hmm. like most states. I think Virginia, New Jersey, we, mm -hmm. we, we have our gubernatorials are in the off year. And so from an investment in terms of grassroots organizing, there's no reason for our campaigning to stay within a time frame between, you know, we'll say May and November. It should be all year round. Yeah. And it should be about not only voter registration, it's about issues education. You were talking before this about people not even having an awareness that there's a campaign. Yeah. You know, um, it shouldn't even be about that. It should be about the issues that matter to us as residents and citizens of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So whether it's getting out for a bond referendum, mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether it's supporting your school bond referendum in your school, in your, in your school district, whether it's about um, understanding what your rights are, whether it's about, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about the end result yeah. of getting a candidate across the finish line. I think that's something that partisans on both sides have, have forgotten, that we have a, a responsibility as leaders in our community to educate our voting populace. Yeah. And so there is a real role for that, and I think that you know both parties could really uh, stand stand to gain a lot by investing in grassroots organizing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I come from the union world. I mean, everyone knows sort of you know I'm, I've worked for the Carpenters Union for the past 12 years, and a lot of what we do is member to member contact, and that's mm -hmm. nothing new. But at the end of the day, though, it's more than about asking for a vote. It's about member education. It's about saying, hey, you know. We care about the economy. We care about jobs. We care about job creation, yeah. and you know we we need you to be involved. We need you to be invested so we can help you. Yeah. And these are the candidates that help you, regardless of political affiliation. These are your candidates who who, who have helped you because you have some really strong advocates out there for for us and some who aren't. Yeah. It's our responsibility to educate our members on that. Yeah. Now, what techni techniques in the grassroots campaign are being utilized, or maybe different than before? Um, I think social media is definitely yeah. is definitely being used that wasn't used before. Yeah. You know, the voter file. You know, we we have access to it. Lots of different unions do, so, mm -hmm. they, so they know how to talk to their own members. But certainly, you see now unions using, especially in the billion trades world, mm -hmm. email yeah. and web communications and Facebook. It's all it's all brand new stuff, and I think yeah. that a lot of people, at least in the billion trades world, are still learning how to sort of harness that a little bit. But I think that. Um, you know, the, the investments there. Yes, it's really exciting because you don't know what the next technological platform is going to be. I was just reading, I think, in 1952, Eisenhower's campaign was the first campaign that actually hired a ad agency. Actually, they had two of them, apparently. Um, 
and that was a start where people started saying, let's really start crafting things. And before it was, I guess, kind of backroom or grassroots. Yeah. And even though that wasn't social media, it was still, as television's coming on, you know, as a new uh, interactive medium. You, you, forget to how, you forget how we got to where yeah. we are, because yeah. so, you're so in the moment. Yeah. And even go, and going back to that quote, it's just it's so interesting, because <laughs> things can evolve, yeah. but the fundamentals are the same. Yeah. When it comes to the art of politicking, when it comes to the art of good governance, the fundamentals remain. Mm -hmm. And I think that when people move so far away from those fundamentals, that's what turns voters off. Mm -hmm. But people who sort of embrace where the changes are, honor sort of where they came from, I think that's what appeals to voters, and I think anyone sort of goes off of off track in that way. I think yeah. they sort of are not, are not set up for success. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's been very informative. It's been really good Trisha to be Trisha Mueller. Here. Thank you. And uh, thanks again. And we'll see you next time on the Hall Institute of Public Policy American Voter 2012 series.